I was with my primary care doctor. Um, she redid the blood work thinking it was a machine um, glitch and it wasn't. So came as a complete shock. And then my journey began. And so I was immediately sent to this wonderful local doctor here at the time. Um, and I adored him. Um, he gave me some information, but he wasn't a CLL specialist by any means. And he was very open to me going to other places. What I really find amazing about it is that 11 years ago, and I might get choked up, I wasn't sure I'd be able to do these things. I didn't know I'd be here. And how lucky am I that I am? Hi, my name is Jeff Folliter. I am a passionate patient advocate. I really take this seriously because it's really, really important for me to share that you can live a great life with CLL, not just a good life, a great life. And it occurs to me as I'm getting ready for an appointment next week, I just entered my 14th year of dealing with CLL. And it seems like yesterday I got the diagnosis. I am Michelle Nadine Baker. I am a medical and health journalist, but I am also a CLL patient. And uh, when I was first diagnosed back in, my goodness, 11 years ago in 2012, uh, things were so much different in the CLL landscape. But I had made a vow once I started treatment to try to help other patients. And ever since then, I've been growing my patient advocacy and patient leadership. And one of the people I do that with is Jeff. We also have to what I would call world-class medical experts joining us. First off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nicole Lamana. She's a hematologist oncologist at Columbia University. And also we have Dr. Spencer Bacow. He's a hematologist oncologist at Boca Raton Regional Hospital. One of the things that Michelle and I constantly hear, constantly see, especially on the internet groups, is the recommendation to get a CLL specialist. It's almost always the first thing that's tossed out to someone new who shows up, go get a CLL specialist. Now, I'm fortunate I live in a metro area. Michelle's fortunate she lives in a metro area. Getting access to a CLL specialist, um, not very difficult for us. We have them around. Not everybody that gets diagnosed with CLL has that access to a CL, CLL specialist, or maybe they do. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. How do you build a strong CLL team when you might not necessarily have one in your hip pocket? Jeff, um, you know, when you heard about specialists, um, did you get to one right away or did you take your time in seeing one? For me, it was right away. I did not feel comfortable with the advice that I was getting. And I leaned on a family member who worked at a large research facility in Houston. And they got me hooked up. But what we've been doing, what you and I have been doing over the past years is encouraging people to get in touch with a CLL specialist, no matter where they are. That's actually something that, that Lisa was encouraged to do. So I want to toss this to Dr. Lamana. How do you work with those local hematologists, oncologists? How does this whole concept of having a CLL expert quarterback, how does it actually work in real life? Well, I mean, what you guys, obviously you both have been blessed by being in cities that have major academic centers that uh, have CLL specialists as part of them. But there's no doubt that we're depending upon where you live in the country that that you know I mean, let's be honest, not every place you know CLL is not a common disease in the sense that it's not like breast cancer or colon cancer. You know CLL is um, relatively small in that sense when we compare them to solid tumor cancers. 
And so, you know, most oncologists might see a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and, and that's fair. And so, you know, although a lot of us would love for every CLL folks to come and see me in New York, we know that's not feasible or possible. And so oftentimes, you know, folks will come for an opinion or to, to discuss their disease or at a crux where they might need treatment. And then I will sort of be in communicate and whether that's first via phone uh, or uh, via email um, or message and start a relationship with their local person to sort of help guide them, particularly if this is not a disease they typically will treat. Um, and so because there are so many drugs, as Dr. Bacow alluded to, there's such an explosion of treatment options that sometimes navigating these treatments um, with patients and also depending upon um, other factors about them and maybe their other medical problems or their disease, sort of picking and choosing between different drugs can, can seem a little daunting. And so oftentimes, you know, I'll, I'll be the go-to to try to communicate with their local physician to see if I can help them and guide them and sort of uh, be a linkage between the patient and their local physician to try to help on their navigate their way. And I will speak honestly about that because then I need them to find somebody that I think is going to be in their best interest. You know, this isn't about egos. I know many, uh, many patients actually feel uncomfortable about having a team because they don't want to, they don't want to upset their local physician. Well, remember, this is all for you. This isn't for me. This isn't for your local physician. This is really about you getting the best care that you need for your CLL. And so I think if you're uncomfortable talking about that with your physician, that can be a problem, right? So you want to be able to uh, uh, communicate with your physician and the physician team about your needs and any issues that arise. And you want, you're going to build a long-term relationship. So you want to find a physician that you can trust um, locally that you can work with throughout the years. And then hopefully if, if advice is needed from somebody like myself, that they're willing to take it because likelihood is I probably see more CLL patients than they do. Dr. Backup, what, what can you add to that? Yeah, just, uh, just echoing what Dr. Lamana said, you know, the CLL specialist is, is very important. I mean, there's the, there's a huge landscape, if that's the right term, of all kinds of different treatment options that we didn't have several years ago, and knowing when to use them and how to use them and how to safely use them, that can be tough for anybody. So employing the CLL specialist is very, very, very helpful as a local CLL doctor and a local hematologist, oncologist. But also, a lot of times, we don't have access to certain clinical trials that our patients may be candidates or may be interested in. And I think that is a huge plus you can get when you have your patient be with the CLL specialist. The local doctor is still important because, you know, local means local. Things happen. Complications happen. Hospitalizations sometimes occur. And if you don't live near your CLL specialist, having somebody there that knows your care is very important. Thank you, doctor. Now, Lisa. I met about four years ago. We've been buddies virtually, and but she lives near where I used to live in Florida. You learned a lot. You were able to be your best own advocate, which is so important. And I've always noted that. Could you share a bit about when you were diagnosed and your experience and, and how you've ended up like this, like so educated and advocating? So um, once I was uh, diagnosed and starting to get thrown into the trenches of what the reality of this was, you would, I became very involved online, um, met Jeff, met some other people that have been dealing with um, CLL for longer, and you hear, find a specialist. Um, and there, there is a lot of information out there if you look for it. And here it was, I used to watch a lot of videos online, and this is where the story turns. Dr. Lamont is very generous of her time and she sits on a lot of panels and I would hear her on these panels. And on some of them, she was sitting right next to my other specialist. Um, he was getting older and was gonna retire too. I knew that was coming. And I just was drawn to her. I, I would listen to her. I, I loved how she spoke, how she relayed information. I loved her personality. I had a visit with my local doctor at the time. Um, and I mentioned Dr. Lamana to him. And he literally looked at me and said, I don't know why I didn't think of this before. And he goes, I, I think they did their residency. They knew each other very well. And he literally in front of me texted her and said, I have a patient and I'm sending her to you. And my daughter was also moving to New York. She was just graduating college. And I think 
you know, you have to find what's going to work in your life. And it made sense. I was going to be going to New York for other purposes anyway. So why not have a specialist there? It just, the puzzle pieces came together. And I had this wonderful team. And I felt that my local doctor, had, he had a better means of communication now. Like my specialist and my local doctor loved them both, trust them both, and they would communicate well. Thank you for sharing that with us. And so one of the top questions Jeff and I are asked a lot is, so how do you find that CLL specialist? Just like I asked Lisa, but, you know, what does that mean? And, and how do you find that right one for you? There are lots of uh, lists of CLL specialists in states all across the country. Um, and so that might provide a starting point for some folks, uh, depending upon where you live. Um, as Lisa noted, you know, part of it is, you know, it, it might be, you might be restricted because you need to see someone in the area that you live because of your circumstances. And, and so you want to do local. So you, you, that's complete. So you have to do what also is what fits for you. And then ultimately, yes, you, you know, your what your personality and a personality of another physician has to jive too. And so not everybody may jive with a particular person. And so that's another layer to add in. Now, when should you see a CSL, CLL specialist? I, I think there's a couple of points that I always bring up. Uh, sometimes, depending upon when someone's initially diagnosed, you know, so sometimes that initial consultation is important. Um, another imp very important time, uh, which Dr. Bacow brought up, is sometimes during when you're told you might need therapy. The question is, do you need therapy? And then what kind of treatment is being recommended because there are such new agents um, and that each patient might have a little bit of a different nuance to their disease. And so I think that's a really another key point in time to see a specialist is when you might be recommended to have therapy and what treatments are being offered. And then, of course, you know, certainly there are, are clinical trials. So I think those are two opportunities that might be important. Um, certainly, uh, any time is a good answer. But but I think if you really don't have the ability to do it very frequently, those key time points might be important. Dr. Bacco, what do you have to add on to that? Yeah, um, you know, anytime's a good time. You don't want to wait too long, um, where in some cases for patients with, you know, very high risk disease, their disease can grow exponentially. And it may be tough to get in to see a CLL specialist because they're also great and they're booked out weeks and weeks and weeks and they're doing favors all the time, you know, double booking patients to bring them in. So I wouldn't necessarily say also that just when you're told that you need treatment, but you know, you, you and your doctor should try to predict, talk together. Am I one of these patients that are more likely to need treatment in the future rather than not need treatment? Maybe now's the time to go get more information, hear what trials are out there, hear what, hear what the treatment landscape uh, looks like now. So if the time does come, you're not rushing to get into somebody and perhaps need to start something before you can even see the CLL specialist and then have to backtrack a little bit. You know, th this brings up, um, you know, that there can be challenges though in getting into CMLN or workarounds and working with different kinds and different healthcare systems. Lisa, what did you experience here? You were working with different healthcare systems. So I found the biggest challenge just to be um, communication with the first specialist I went to. Um, also changing of doctors when my first doctor suddenly left for a different facility. Um, and then my local doctor just struggling um, with getting calls and emails returned. Um, he would voice a little bit of frustration to me um, when I would come in for appointments that he hadn't gotten the information he needed. And could I call and try and see if I could get things sent? So that was really the biggest challenge. And part of what made me feel I wasn't, didn't quite have my right team yet. You need to have trust in both your doctors. And to me, the biggest thing is communication. I think having a specialist nowadays, we have telemedicine visits. So if you can't travel as much, it's really important to try to get in the system with a specialist so that when they are needed, if your disease does accelerate, you're already in the system, as we mentioned before. But we can also, I can see Dr. Bacow here, and if we have questions, if there's an unknown, we're unsure, I can see Dr. Lamana via telemedicine visit um, through Columbia Health. He, we can send my lab reports. So I think it's the communication 
the ease of appointments, whether you're traveling or doing virtual and trusting both your doctors and that your doctors are willing to have a shared patient relationship with each other. And that's what I have been fortunate to find not once, but twice. And I feel so grateful for that. I would love to tie two thoughts together if you'll indulge me for just a moment. You went through a lot in the beginning. You, you had to deal with different doctors. You had to deal with travel. You had to deal with different levels of comfort. And ultimately, it was your comfort your ability to mesh well with the doctor as opposed to being abrasive that guided your decisions. And I want everybody that's watching this to know that's really, really important. We've got two doctors on this program right now who are enthusiastic and, and, and their, their personalities are, are, are top of the scale. That doesn't always happen with every patient relationship. Like you said, Dr. Lamana, the goal here is not a short-term relationship. The goal is a long-term relationship. Just how do you coordinate between a local oncologist and a CLL specialist at a distance? This can be a lot of heavy lifting. Dr. Lamana, I'll start with you. I mean, certainly phone and messaging and texting are one way, getting records seamlessly. Sometimes those are via email, attachments, faxes. You know, I think as long as the two physicians are willing to communicate, now be it, remember, different physicians may want to communicate in different fashions, but as long as you can make a connection between the two and they figure out which way works best for them, that's fine. But really, I mean, the best way of communicating, and not just like Dr. Lamana said, you know, every, every doctor is different, best way of communicating is, is probably more direct, email cell phone, do the doctors have, do the two doctors have a prior relationship together? Do they see each other at national meetings? Luckily, the hematology and CLL world is somewhat small and people do know each other, knew, do we know each other quite a bit, but having the two doctors having had a prior relationship, maybe they shared a patient in the past, I think is important, but that doesn't always happen. You know, um, you do have to recognize that doctors are busy and, you know, what you really should also discuss with your local doctor, your local hematologist on college is also is what changes are, you know, what kind of changes that we're seeing, what, what kind of changes would we see that would really warrant us reaching out to the CLL specialist sooner rather than later? We're just sending the office note, letting them know the most recent CBC results or physical exam, et cetera, is, would suffice, or do we, what kind of changes would warrant us to pick up the phone and call them? I've had an experience where I learned that it doesn't matter how much you email or if you do happen to get their cell phone, I'm just not going to be able to talk to this doctor. But I've learned to build relationships with that doctor's staff, the nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, advanced clinic nurses, and who have direct access to the CLL specialists. And they've been able to convey information. And I feel comfortable with that. And as long as the patient feels felt comfortable with that, then it turned out to be okay. Thank you, doctors, for those answers, because that is something we all worry about. Um, so our next section is about different opinions between doctors. What do you do if your two doctors disagree or have differing opinions on next steps for you, the patient? Dr. Baca, what happens if your doctors have varying opinions about next steps for approach and care? How can patients and caregivers understand the right way to go? Yeah, just know that um, if you're going to have, you know, more than one CLL specialist, and some people get multiple opinions or have multiple people weighing in, there is a good chance at some point that there's going to be a difference in opinion on how you're treated. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. The treatment for CLL has become very nuanced, and sometimes there's more than one right answer. But if you put yourself in the patient's shoes, it can be very frustrating and anxiety-provoking. Um, speaking, you know, really kind of speak to each doctor and, and say, you know, this, you know, be frank with them. I've seen other doctors and they're recommending this. Why would you not recommend that? And you're recommending this instead. But something else you can do is um, if you do develop what I call analysis paralysis, if you have so many different opinions and um, you're not sure what to do with them, you could use your local doctor to help kind of bridge them all together and kind of weigh the pros and cons of each one to help yourself make an informed decision. But it is, it's is—it's a tough but situation, but it's also a fortunate situation that um, if you have the um, ability to have multiple opinions from multiple CLL doctors, but just know that it can be very frustrating, but it can be managed. No, I mean, it, it is very true. I mean, there 
there uh, there are issues that um that there are true circumstances where there, there's more than one drug that could be totally applied to a particular individual which is a good thing meaning that they they have a lot of also looking at other things like um, side effects of the therapy, uh, you know, social circumstances, perhaps your ability to go to and from the clinic, perhaps one therapy might require a hospitalization or more frequent monitoring and may not, maybe that doesn't work with your lifestyle right now. So I think there's more than one thing that might go also into choosing an agent if there's more than one that's being offered um, that will be more personal, perhaps not necessarily all due to your specifics about your disease. Um, but there's no doubt that, you know, certainly you can get more than, you can get another opinion, but that you, sometimes that can be a little bit limiting too, because then it becomes a little bit difficult as, as Dr. Backow noted, it can be challenging sometimes when you're getting five different opinions, uh, then what do you choose? And you're the one who's faced with that. So that's a little uh, challenging. Usually it's not that many uh, differences of opinion, but it does occasionally happen. And then sitting down and talking about the different options with somebody who's who will be more than willing to go through all those options, I think is important that you can kind of level out all the playing field and see where the differences really are. And that'll help guide to you choose something that, that works for you. We are so glad that you joined us today. And we hope that you'll look for more programs with more content, just like we are presenting now. If you want alerts, if you want to be in the know, click this link right here. We'll promise to get that information to you. So Dr. Baca, I'm going to ask you first, and then Dr. Lamana, you're up after him. What kind of guidance can you give patients and their caregivers as far as living that great life? I, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, um, you should definitely live your life to the fullest, um, staying in close touch with your family. You're still thinking about your CLL diagnosis, but if you're working, continue to work. If you're still able to, continuing your usual activities of daily living. I don't have much to add except, you know, I like to, I've always taught people that this is a chronic disease and um, doesn't mean, again, that this isn't an important point, part of your life, but you need to live your life. And this is a, a chronic condition that you can live with and that we can manage. We honestly hope that each of you has taken away useful tips from this little program that we put on and some clarity and guidance on how to build a great CLL team and how to work with different physicians on your team. Um, it makes a big impact. I'm going to toss this to Lisa. Tell us about that impact. So just like you were saying, I mean, live your life. You've got to, you know, do things that bring you joy, that relieve, relieve your stress levels, and then just be confident in the team you create once you find it. And that can be a journey. Um, I'm, you know, lucky I am able to travel into New York, but I'm also lucky that I have Dr. Backhow here, who, you know, I can honestly say, I think I'll be seeing more of Dr. Backhow and not necessarily as much as do of Dr. Lamana because of the ease, because of my trust level in him and knowing that he's also well on his way to becoming a CLL specialist and how lucky am I. Um, but I love traveling New York and I'll check in and I know she's she's beaming her, her, uh, her uh, mentee, but um, live your life, enjoy, find doctors you trust, trust in yourself. Um, advocate for yourself, whether it be insurance, your treatment, whatever comes up in our health care, um, and just do the best you can. We're talking about living a great life, living your best life. Tell us what you've been doing for the past six months. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had two children get engaged four weeks apart, so I've been planning weddings, and in the midst of all that, we were building our dream home, so we just had wedding one, we moved into our dream home, and now I'm well into planning bridal shower two, wedding two, and just enjoying all of it. And what I really find amazing about it is that 11 years ago, and I might get choked up, I wasn't sure I'd be able to do these things. I didn't know I'd be here. And how lucky am I that I am? And hopefully in the next few years, when we have another panel, I'll be able to say I'm a grandma. 
no. <laughs> Outstanding. I love it. That's that is the stuff that I love to hear. That people aren't just saying words. They're not just parroting things. They're doing that. They're having those moments. We we've got the hope for a cure for some of us. We've got great treatment programs. We can do this.